Good afternoon, everyone, both to those in the room and the ones watching us online. Okay, some minor technical glitches. Let's see what's happening. Okay, good afternoon once more. Uh, I'm Anna Lucic and I will be your Master of Ceremony for today. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to IT Manufacturing South event tackling the topics of global chipset shortage and industry disruptions. We have worked very diligently on making this event outstanding, so we do hope that you will be enjoying the strings of discussions and keynote speeches coming up soon. Uh, before passing the floor to our host, Gianmario Maggio, for some introductory and opening remarks, I would just like to give you a couple of housekeeping rules. So just for you all to be aware, the entire session will be recorded and made available after the end of the event. For those of you present in the room, once the time comes for the panel session, you will get the opportunity, if the time allows us, to make some questions. So please make sure to seize it. Also, last but not least, of course, one minor, minor practical remark goes to our outstanding speakers. Please make sure to respect your allocated time slot. The, and now, with this, I would like to call on here on the stage with us Gianmario Maggio, uh, Managing Director of IT Manufacturing South. So give him a warm round of applause. Gianmario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Gianmario Maggio, and I'm responsible for IT Manufacturing for Southern Europe. So a very warm welcome to our event, which is held in the context of the World Manufacturing Forum 2022. So let me start by saying a few words regarding EIT Manufacturing. EIT Manufacturing is a pan-European innovation ecosystem, which is supported by EIT. What is EIT? It is the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, uh, which is uh, investing 400 million euros for the first seven years in this uh, initiative in order to accelerate innovation in the manufacturing sector. EIT Manufacturing brings together more than 85 leading partners across Europe representing industry, research and education, coming from 17 different countries. And uh, in the context of this year, uh, overarching theme of the uh, WMF, uh, namely the redesigning the supply chains, uh, we would like to address uh, the issues affecting the semiconductor industry and the corresponding value chain uh, in order to, make, to find uh, remedies uh, to address this important uh, challenge for the European industry. And likewise, we would like to address also the implication for the other industries that are suffering from, this, from the chips shortage. So to start with, semiconductors are really at the heart of innovation and they are key for the current uh, digitalization of industry and an essential element for guaranteeing future sustainable products and services. So the value of the semiconductor market has surpassed 600 billion euro in 2022, according to the world <coughs> semiconductor trade statistics. And when we look at the manufacturing semiconductor in Europe, <coughs> this used to, to be around 40% back in the 90s. And nowadays, uh, this percentage has uh, shrunk down to uh, be <coughs> below 9%. So that's a quite a remarkable difference. And on top, uh, over the last uh, two years, uh, the crises that are affecting the world uh, are making also uh, the semiconductor suffering and causing the current uh, chipset shortage. Uh, so what does this mean uh, for other industries? So this has uh, affecting more than 170 industries, uh, spanning from the automotive sector to avionics, uh, to computer, uh, to consumer electronics, and so on. And in the current situation, the global supply chain continues to be disrupted. Therefore, we need to address uh, these, uh, uh, these outstanding challenges. So in the next uh, couple of hours, we will address key topics uh, spanning from the creation of semiconductor pr production facilities in Europe, and this will be addressed by Intel, how this infrastructure can also be uh, flanked by the appropriate uh, skills development, which will be addressed by ST Microelectronics, uh, and how to redesign the supply chain for the semiconductor industry, uh, which will be, will be a key topic uh, by Infineon. Uh, we are also eager to know which measures are being taken at a European level, and we will have a contribution by the um, 
European Commission and FBK on the Euro European Chips Act, uh, looking at uh, infrastructure building, security of supply, and when needed, uh, also crisis response mechanism. So without any further ado, uh, let me give the floor back to Anna Lucic, who will be introducing our distinguished speakers for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gian Mario, for the introduction. We see you again in the closing of the event. So, as already mentioned, our next speaker coming up is Mr. Marco Ceccarelli, Program Officer, Electronics and Photonics Industry, European Commission, who will be giving us more insights on the EU Chips Act. Marco is connected with us live from Amsterdam. Marco, greetings from Porsche Experience Center. Over to you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, uh, John Mario. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for inviting us to give you an overview of uh, what the Commission has envisaged in order to address the issues um, of the chips shortage and general the disruption caused on the supply chain. So if you like, we can start with the slides. I don't know if you can uh, see them. Well, you know how it is with these hybrid events, it can always happen. Give us a second. I see it here on yeah, the spy no monitor, but I think that the yes, audience should good. see it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. So if um, uh, unless you have a problem on your side, I will proceed with the presentation. So as I said, uh, this is uh, concerning the response that uh, the European Commission has prepared to address the chip shortage um, and in the proposal that we have made um, to consider the crisis that we have uh, experienced in the last uh, couple of years, uh, in view particularly of the detrimental effect that this has, uh, has had on uh, several industries, uh, obviously um, we are all aware of the impact this had on the automotive sector, um, with uh, people still waiting for their cars they ordered one year ago or more, um, this had an impact uh, which can be quantified in uh, millions of uh, cars that could not be uh, shipped uh, with uh, 200 billion lost revenues uh, uh, in a year. And, uh, and also an impact of a third of car sales in a year that couldn't be sold because of the uh, lack of components. But this is probably the most visible industry, but there are many more that have been affected, such as uh, the telecom industry uh, or healthcare industry. Um, some life-saving equipment could not be produced or maintained because of the lack of chips. And the same we can see in other sectors, including the sector of uh, renewable uh, energy because of uh, some uh, um, important uh, equipment that couldn't be shipped. Um, which is particularly important now with the energy crisis. So obviously we know that there's an increase of demand um, and this has contributed to the fragilities, particularly because of the uh, pandemic with many people uh, making use of uh, their PCs and tablets, and et cetera, to, uh, uh, to telework and uh, to study from home. Um, but disruptions are um, actually uh, likely to happen in this uh, supply chain because it's a uh, relative fragile um, and this is due to a number of factors including the concentration of production in Asia which is responsible for 75 percent of the production of chips on a global basis and in particular you have some concentration when we talk about uh, advanced chips uh, for instance in uh, in taiwan we have a company at tsmc which is responsible for over 90 percent of the most advanced chips in the world so um then we have in addition to this uh, some geopolitical tensions and we are you are all well aware of uh, some of those uh, particularly in south china sea um, which led to um, several uh, impact also on the supply chain. For instance, ex export control measures imposed by the US on China also had impact on European companies. Um, so uh, coming now to the uh, market that we see, um, sorry, but I'm unable to move to the next slide for some, for whatever reason. I don't know if uh, on your side you could uh, do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we see that obviously there is a phenomenal growth of demand of chips uh, coming in the, in the next uh, few years 
before 2030, we expect the market to be doubling with respect to what we had uh, last year. According to analysts, this is going to exceed uh, $1 trillion. Uh, with several emerging opportunities in, uh, in AI, in edge computing, digital transformation, but also uh, electrification of mobility. Uh, now, in this context, let's, if we can move to the next slide. Um, in, in this context, uh, of course, we see also that the uh, uh, Commission has, uh, I, I don't know, but I'm unable to, uh, yeah. Um, I have, uh, we, we observe also uh, that in terms of investment manufacturing capacity, um, the cost of equipment, uh, and per particularly for a leading edge uh, um, production, has uh, increased phenomenally in the last uh, 10 years. We see a triplication of costs. And um, th at the same time, the European industry spending did not increase. Therefore, with the stable level of investment, we see that our share of capacity has declined. Now it's around 7%. So this creates dependencies of Europe in terms of which is a risk for in terms of sovereignty, security, and our economy at large. Production is capital intensive, requires major upfront investment in the order of 20 billion dollars uh, for new advanced uh, uh, fabrication uh, uh, facilities. Um, and we, the companies need uh, an offset of their risk, and this is why public investment is uh, needed. Also, because semiconductors is recognized as a key strategic value with very wide impact. So the main economies have decided important incentive measures. Europe had to respond as well, and the context justifies the article, an article of the treaty, which um, uh, envisaged the aid uh, to facilitate economic activities of common European interest. If you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so the EU Chips Act uh, um, has been announced by the President von der Leyen in September of last year. Uh, to create a state of the world uh, uh, European chip ecosystem um, with uh, uh, a world class research, design, and production capacities. Um, yeah, I, I will try to uh, reload uh, the, uh, the clicker, but uh, yeah, let's see if it works. Um, apologies for the technical uh, uh, issue. Um, so, in general, in, in terms of key objectives, of course, we are talking about strengthening our research and technology leadership, um, building and reinforcing our innovation capacity, uh, particularly production capacity uh, by 2030, but also address the acute uh, shortage that we have in terms of skills. And this is uh, a, a, an issue that we have in attracting new talent to Europe. Where do we stand with this proposal? It, is, it has been discussed in Council in the last few months, and we are um, now expecting adoption of the general approach by December 1st. So we are very close uh, to uh, completing the negotiation with Council. And in Parliament, we expect a plenary vote in February 23. And we are currently discussing several parliamentary committees so that we can start a trialogue uh, uh, negotiation between the um, the three bodies, Council, Parliament and Commission, for a potential adoption by mid of next year. Um, the uh, three pillars of the CHIPS Act are essentially the, the first one is the CHIPS for Europe initiative. I'm going to focus on, this, on, the, on these three pillars in the uh, next slides. The second one is about security of supply, so essentially about production facilities. And the third one is about uh, monitoring the supply chain and the possibility to respond to crisis. Now, CHIPS for Europe initiative uh, is about bridging the gap from lab to fab because we have excellence in, uh, in R&D, but we often fail to, uh, to transform this in terms of market innovation. Therefore, we want to build a, a virtual design platform to uh, expand our design capabilities and, and, uh, and our possibility to create European IP. Um, also doing this through uh, prototyping through pilot lines. Um, and the same we are going to do also for quantum chips um, and create a network of competence centers across uh, Europe. So each member state would have a, a clear uh, center of reference for their needs in terms of skills and support uh, to uh, make use of the facilities uh, uh, described above. 
Also, uh, we uh, consider the establishment of the Chiefs Fund to facilitate access to loans and equity for startups and SMEs. Now, the uh, second pillar is about security of supply, uh, so essentially about manufacturing facilities. Uh, we see two different kinds. One is uh, to produce uh, chips for the uh, same undertaking uh, that owns the facility or uh, for um, unrelated undertakings so for third parties. In this case, we are talking about uh, open foundries. Uh, we did this by introducing the concept of first of a kind in Europe, which means that uh, when you have innovation in terms of product or process, uh, not to distort competition in the, in, uh, in the union, this can uh, qualify for getting uh, state aid. Um, we already see that we have uh, relevant, relevant projects that have been announced in this context already. Uh, major investment across Europe by Intel uh, with the first project in Germany, in Magdeburg, but we also see uh, under, un, under negotiation a few more um, uh, facilities being discussed around Europe, including Italy. Um, a recent announcement by Infineon, as well as uh, NST, Microelectronics and Global Foundries in Germany and in France. Um, in terms of security, uh, uh, in terms of the stages of the production that this is, includes uh, wafer production, the wafer processing, the standard front end and back end, so including also IC assembly. And innovation, as I said, can be in terms of performance uh, of, the, of the product or of the process, and uh, or also in terms of energy or environmental performance. Um, now let's come to the supply chain how do we plan to monitor that uh, this is uh, uh, we uh, together with the member states uh, we are going to create a, a semiconductor european semiconductor board uh, but already with uh, through a recommendation uh, um, which was uh, adopted in uh, uh, in february 8 uh, together with the announcement uh, with the proposal of the chips act we have created an expert group uh, by which uh, the member state can already act to collect information for monitoring the supply chain. Um, and uh, in case of a crisis, uh, uh, then this will uh, trigger other events. So uh, the assessment uh, of the commission together with the industry will analyze potential disruption in the supply chain, which have potential negative effects on one or more important uh, sectors of the industry and uh, to consider measures to, um, uh, to, uh, to address this issue through, um, say, uh, an implementation act, implementing act, uh, which uh, envisage a, a crisis, the creation of the crisis stage with an emergency toolbox that uh, would um, allow us to uh, gather information, to have uh, priority orders for the critical sector, and also expert, expert uh, uh, control measures. Um, now, we obviously do not have control of the full value chain. Uh, we are not uh, striving for outer key. Uh, it would be fool to uh, think that we can act uh, uh, independently from the rest of the world because semiconductor value chain is global and spread over different uh, regions. So we need to cooperate with like-minded uh, partner countries to manage uh, interdependencies um, and uh, ensure um, uh, security of supply in uh, also in crisis situation. And for these reasons, we are in, uh, in bilateral discussions with uh, different uh, uh, countries around the world, particularly of relevance is the uh, Trade and uh, Technology Council that we have with the United States to coordinate measures to uh, in terms of uh, security of supply and to exchange information and have coordination in terms of uh, um, indeed uh, supply issues uh, um, and uh, estimation of demand uh, the same we are doing actually also in digital partnerships with other asian countries such as uh, taiwan uh, korea um, japan uh, and others now um how do we plan to uh, collect the information? I think this is uh, actually uh, very important uh, uh, that we uh, collect the right uh, set of information from the uh, companies in the field. So I guess that uh, also uh, among the participants today, it would be essential to uh, consider not only the semiconductor industry itself, 
uh, but also the downstream industries, uh, all the industries that uh, may have uh, been uh, potentially affected by the chip shortage, to have uh, uh, their participation in this survey uh, so that we uh, get to a better understanding of the supply chain and, uh, and because this will be a valuable source of information for us to uh, have a better monitoring and, uh, and we would be aggregating results in an anonymous fashion so it will not be uh, tracking the individual companies but it helps us also to explore a potential early warning indicators of a potential crisis and, uh, and uh, helps us you know, define an approach towards uh, a monitoring mechanism that will be uh, activated uh, um, in the uh, semicond European Semiconductor Board, uh, and particularly in a situation of crisis. Therefore, I would like to invite uh, the, uh, your uh, participants uh, uh, today uh, to participate to this uh, consultation. Uh, we have uh, um, a web page uh, uh, dedicated to this uh, semiconductor value chain uh, consultation on the digital strategy um, page of the uh, European Commission website. So I invite you to make use of that and uh, contribute uh, to a more uh, stable and uh, secure uh, supply of chips in the future for your own industries. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marco, for, uh, for these amazing insights. It was a pleasure having you with us. With no further ado, I hand over to Professor Richard John Hall Wilton, Director of the Sensors and Devices Center from Bruno Kessler Foundation from Trento, Italy. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Is that on? Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> Great. So, thank you very much. Are there slides? So, and thank you to the organizers for the invite and thank you for all for coming here. So I'm going to, uh, you just heard in the last talk about uh, the IPCHE, so the important projects of common European interest on microelectronics and I'm just going to talk through how this actually supports, uh, you know, at the base level uh, part of this, uh, this ecosystem. And I think in the context of that, I think the, the ecosystem, ah, okay. That's better. Okay, I think the ecosystem is a is is a a good analogy um, for uh, for the semiconductor industry, and I think on that because you know if you think of an ecosystem and what makes it strong, um, you know it's complex. Um, you know, and the Nobel Prize for Physics last year was about complexity, and uh, sort of you know to paraphrase that sort of maybe slightly incorrectly, you know where things are complex. Um, is where everything is interesting. And the other thing is, is that, you know, to have a strong ecosystem, you have to have a good level of diversity in depth and breadth, and you have to make sure that that diversity is maintained. And without that, that's, uh, you know, going to be problems. So I think, you know, in the context of what I'm about to tell you about, is to talk about this diversity and show you at a very top level, very quickly, very pictorially, how this diversity is and how the IPCHE supports it. And of course, I will do this in the context of uh, the institute at, at which I am. So starting off with the, with the institute, it's the Fondazione Bruno Kessler. It's in Trento, Italy. It's, a, it's about two hours from here. Um, it's a research institute uh, which is uh, celebrating its 60th year this year. And of course, it's about excellence in science and technology. But I think what's also important here is that there's an emphasis on interdisciplinary approaches and also about applying it. So it's about making sure that the research results actually end up in products in the market. So 11 research centers, about 400 researchers, and a number of laboratories. In the context of what I'm talking about here, um, it's, it's to do with the sensors and devices sensor center. So this is something like 100 employees um, and over 130 uh, publications a year. Um, there's a large number of active finance projects, including a large number of EU projects, and uh, there are major infrastructures associated, as you'll see, and a significant patent portfolio. 
Um, I think also very important to point out is that in terms of company collaborations, there's well above 40 collaborations where we're directly working on, on making sure uh, that these sensors actually come out. So let's going back to the definition of sensors and devices, you know, to keep it there. So sensors are, you know, is a device that's used to record something uh, or see changes in something and devices are an object or machine particular purpose such as an electronic device and you know nice and simple there thinking about that if you think about for example many of you from the automotive industry if you think about automotive industry uh, not so long ago um, it was very much a mechanical item um, and now of course it's very much it's a very high-tech mechanical item but there's a huge amount of electronics in there and I think you see that in pretty much everything in modern day life uh, that sensors and devices are absolutely everywhere. You know, all of you carry a mobile phone with you. Um, you know, there used to be a couple of sensors in there. Now there's five, 10, 15, 20. There's a huge amount of data there. So this is something that's really ubiquitous to modern life. So what do we do? We, we basically have the aim to do research and develop leading edge sensors and devices based around technological platforms. Uh, we do this in silicon and related fabrication techniques. So of course, that's relevant to what we're talking today. And we do that because it's scalable. So if we have a product, we can scale it. And also, you know, we have the ability to contribute across the development chain, either at one place or throughout. So from, from the actual idea and the concept to actually fabricating it ourselves in-house at, at a small or medium scale and bringing it to the market, you know, or working with a partner who, who does a large part of that. And of course, this is for research and also to get products to, to market. So now what I'm going to do to show you that sort of diversity within this niche of sensors and devices, which is a small niche within the semiconductor market, I'm going to very quickly show you an overview of what we do to give you an idea that just from this niche, how big this Diversity is, no, I'm not. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> so, where were we? Let's start from so, scratch, or at least from the slide yeah. we have the last time. Maybe I talk through it anyway, because, um, you know, uh, we, we keep the time under control then. So yes, uh, and maybe absolutely. it comes back at some point. So, you know, one of the things we do <clears throat> is on photonics and quantum technology. Quantum technology came up as a something of interest within the uh, uh, CHIPS Act, because obviously it's a key technology for the future. And photonics is obviously a key thing. And here, you know, we have uh, things ongoing in nanomaterials nanomaterials in integrated optics and also integrating sensors into there. And we do this across a wide wavelength range from visible um, near UV infrared um, and across various material platforms. Other slides going to come back? The tech team? Okay. So please, if you can, you can continue with this, and then we will make the slides available post-event. No Thank problem. you. No problem. Okay. So, you know, there's also a wide range of, uh, you know, uh, if we look then, we also do things on integrated readout ASICs and image sensor products, okay? Um, and this across, you know, single photon images, uh, monolithic active pixel sensors, multi-spectral X-ray and terahertz, uh, devices, so things for thing, also for things like LiDAR and on readout ASICs themselves. If we then look at all of that, we, we do this across a very wide range of application fields. Um, so quantum science and technology I already mentioned. We do all of this for uh, the space industry as well. We do it for big science as well. Um, and uh, also in the biomedical food health sectors, uh, for the security sectors um, in, in terms of imaging and uh, also in terms of uh, actually for the automotive industry as well. We have several projects. Additionally, um, we have a lot of uh, uh, 
sort of products in the custom radiation sensors. So again, this is for the medical field. This is for big science. So most of the CERN experiments, we provide a lot of the silicon to them uh, and neutrino physics as well. Um, and uh, also for the space industry, you know, and for the space industry, we're doing things like uh, single wafer or whole wafer uh, actual uh, uh, sensors. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, sort of uh, SIPM tiles, also including so silicon photomultiplier tiles, especially for the medical industry, where we, we make these up to, so they cover larger areas, and things for satellites with, which are actually flying and for future satellite projects and also for nanosatellites. Um, if I move on to uh, uh, what we're doing in, in the MEMS area, um, so uh, there are things that we, we do for flow centers, for, for example, very topical um, on, uh, at the moment with the uh, possibly putting hydrogen into the, uh, uh, into the gas to make up a fraction. So we're doing monitoring of that to look up the fractions. And uh, also uh, for the automotive industry, stress sensors, for example, uh, to, uh, to do direct measurements of braking and for many other applications as well and also for satellites in terms of uh, uh, mechanisms as, as a gyroscope. On the more exploratory direction, there are many technologies for quantum devices, such as superconducting devices. Lots of the quantum technology is based around superconducting devices, and we, we do a lot in that direction. And also in brain-inspired devices, um, there are... Uh, uh, you know, things that we're doing, looking at actually sort of brain organized, so looking at the how the 3D interaction compares the 2D interaction, which is normally due to see, of course, that's what the brain actually does and see how much a difference the neurons make, and also on uh, adaptive memories uh, for artificial intelligence. So that's an overview of, of what we do. If we look at the actual um, facilities we have ourselves, so... Uh, we have something like uh, uh, 1,200 square meters of uh, ISO 4 to 6 uh, semiconductor clean rooms at the moment. Um, and, you know, one of the things that IPCHE allows us to do is, is to move that to above 2,000 meters. So this is a 2,000 square meters, a significant increase in what we can do capacity-wise and also capability. In addition to, to, to those areas, you know, we have sort of cleaner areas, which we call a, the detector clean room. Uh, where, of course, it, it, it's along the sort of line of a pure CMOS process. Uh, if we look at towards the MEMS, we, of course, need a little bit more exotic materials in there, uh, and so divide it off. There's also testing areas, integration areas, and a large micro-nano analytical facility. So actually, then, you know, I've talked a lot about what IPJ is doing. I think, you know, um, it, it's really the aim is to, to improve the production of the devices in Europe. Uh, it's, a, it's a key strategic instrument, as was outlined by the last speaker, uh, for European industry. Um, if we look at the, the initial microelectronics project, which is ongoing at the moment, uh, start, started out with 32 companies and, and research institutes um, from four countries on 43 sub-projects. Uh, but if you look at the ecosystem that builds up, it's about 400 uh, uh, indirect partners involved. So I think you can already see that it's supporting a very diverse and wide community already. There are five technology fields which are affected, one of which is sensors, and that's, of course, the one we're in. And, you know, within that project, what we, what we get, which is ongoing at the moment, is, you know, it's about equipment, it's about buildings, it's about people, it's about the research effort to to achieve that, and of course, you know, we have our individual projects within there, for example, uh, towards 3D integration with through silicon wires to put the sensor and the readout chip together, for example, for so silicon photomultipliers. So with the, with the IPJ, it's hoped that there will be a continuation, and if approved, this will move up to 20 states, more than 100 members. Um, so you can see this is going to a very large scale, very much approaching this diversity and multiplicity that I talked about. And of course, at some point, we hope that this is connected with the CHIPS Act. And I think on this, it achieves sustainability by strengthening the ecosystem. So um, if I then finish off, 
okay? Um, so the semiconductor ecosystem is very integrated, global, complex, and really affects everything in everyday life. Okay, that's the reason why this uh, discussion is here today. And really strengthening and building on the existing ecosystem is, uh, is, is one of the things with the key aspects on this, okay? And it's all about everything from the ideas, the research, to the capacity, and actually implementing it. And I think, you know, I showed an example of what we do as the center um, in terms of uh, uh, making sure that there's a, in this niche of sensors, there's still a huge diversity within that. Um, so I showed how the IPCHE microelectronics uh, was an example of strengthening this. And uh, also that, you know, it takes a longer term view on the research and uh, setting the parameters for, for future success in terms of societal and manufacturing challenges. And the last thing is, is that, you know, uh, collaboration on, on, you know, making sure that these complex ETO systems are supported and built up is something that Europe, Europe is very good at doing this sort of thing. And, you know, it's about nurturing and building all parts of the ecosystem. And ideally, this will mean that the industry is less cyclical, so it smooths out the pe peaks and troughs. Skills and training, I think there's a talk on later, but is absolutely essential um, to, to make sure it's there. And, you know, just to finish off with my message, it's, it's, you know, chips crisis or opportunity is the sort of question I would put, you know, because you, really to come out of what's happening, to build on it, to build something where you get rid of this cyclical system and you actually have a, a, a stronger ecosystem is something that's a real opportunity. So. A big... A big thank you to Professor Hall Wilton. So I'm, a I'm, I'm very, very sorry that you haven't been uh, able to see all the slides, but the good news is that we will share them after the end of the event. And of course, our online audience is watching them in the stream. So with no further ado, our next speaker comes all the way from Brussels representing Intel and is the Director of Security and Technology Policy. Warm welcome to Ricardo Masucci and his keynote speech on building chips at manufacturing capacity in Europe. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for the kind invitation to EIT. Thanks to the speakers for their uh, insightful uh, contributions so far. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here. Uh, I work with Intel. Uh, as, you, as you probably know, Intel has been manufacturing in Europe for over 30 years. And as Marco Ceccarelli mentioned earlier, uh, in his presentation, we are on a journey to uh, expand our footprint in Europe with uh, planned investments in uh, uh, Germany, uh, but also in the US in, uh, in an attempt to contribute to rebalance the global supply chain of uh, semiconductors. Today, uh, and I'm sorry for the audience in the room, there's a colorful slide, a beautiful slide, believe me. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could, but I don't know if we can turn it. So the, the, I wanted to start with, uh, with some of the long-term market dynamics and some of the long-term factors that influence our semiconductor supply chain, uh, as well as with some uh, short-term uh, short uh, uh, unpredictable and unforeseeable events that we all witnessed over the, over the past couple of years. Uh, all these factors, all these market dynamics uh, brought uh, analysts and industry uh, to rethink and uh, consider how to restruct, sorry, restructure uh, global supply chains that so far uh, were conceived to be able to deliver products just in time. And now these supply chains need to be able to deliver products just in case of major uh, major disruptions. Uh, so the first element that I wanted to, to highlight, and I have another slide that you won't be able to see in the room, but <laughs> uh, it's actually a, a graph um, later on. The first point that was already highlighted by uh, Marco Ceccarelli is the ever-growing demand and consumption uh, worldwide and in Europe to address the needs of our modern digitized society. Uh, the second element that I would like to stress is the fact that there, there has been uh, 
uh, a decades long steady decline in uh, manufacturing, in chip manufacturing, uh, combined with uh, uh, an increased dependency on Asia when it comes to, to chips manufacturing. This is linked to a number of factors, including the rise of new uh, business models, fabless, fab light comp companies, uh, and so on. Uh, the third element that I wanted to uh, highlight to, the, to this audience is the fact that higher costs and um, higher um, technical complexity of producing chips brought to specialization and consolidation. Consolidation uh, is, you know, um, it is apparent in the, in the fact that today there are only three companies worldwide that, that are able to produce leading edge technologies. TSMC, Samsung and Intel. So uh, those are the companies that can produce below 10, 10 nanometers. And then when it comes to specialization due to the high costs of, of R&D. Specialization, uh, a great example in my view is uh, ASML. Uh, the, um, maybe something is moving on behind me, excellent news. Um, this is the first step. <laughs> Let's make the magic. Let's make the magic happen. We cannot solve the supply chain disruption, but at least this, not this, of, this afternoon we can, we can do it. So what I was saying is that uh, ASML is, is a great example of the fact that this uh, Dutch company that produces uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography uh, machinery, they are those that are actually enabling uh, leading, edge, uh, leading edge manufacturing production. And then in the slide that I hope you will be able to, to see also in the room, I pointed out three um, unforeseeable events uh, that we actually witnessed over the past couple of years. Geopolitical tensions, the, nobody would have expected the, the, the war in Ukraine. Here, here we go. We applause for the lead wall, please. Uh, definitely nobody would have expected, for instance, uh, uh, also um, uh, n the severe blizzard that hit uh, uh, Austin last year and brought to the shutdown of uh, facilities for Samsung and NXP. And we can also expect that uh, due to the climate change, the, sev the severity and the, um, and the frequency of this natural disaster might, uh, might increase. And I don't need to explain why pandemics, uh, the, the pandemics, the global health emergency has been disruptive to the global su uh, supply chain. Uh, I want to make a, a quick deep dive on the ever-growing chip consumption in uh, in Europe. Uh, this uh, this this is borrowed from uh, from a study from Kearney, a strategic management firm, that shows clearly how in the next ten years uh, there will be uh, a growing consumption of chips. So this is not just the demand of industry. Consumption includes also uh, what. Every, uh, everyone uses our, uh, our smartphone, the type of uh, cloud services that we use, etc. And this is uh, focused on consumption of leading edge nodes. You can see that right now the value uh, that 44% that uh, on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the graph, that, uh, sorry, that 44 is billions, uh, which, uh, which is the value of the market of chips today in Europe and 80 is the value of the market in 2030, projected by, by Kearney. As you can see on the, on the top of, uh, of the graph, there's uh, the, the slice, the, the portion of leading edge is going to grow in terms of consumption in Europe for the reasons that I, that I already partially mentioned, AI, um, uh, 5G, cloud, and all the other, all the other applications that require uh, a lot of computing power. In the interest of time, I need to move to the next slide where I just wanted to uh, flag to, to the audience the fact that for leading edge chips, the, the manufacturing capacity in Europe, if you, if you look, Europe is the, is the, is the dark blue uh, at, the, at the bottom of, of the graph. 20 years ago, uh, the, the portion of uh, manufacturing capacity in Europe was much higher than now. If you see uh, around 2020, Europe is non-existent. That little bump, that little blue bump, is our uh, our fab. Uh, that one is our fab in Ireland that was recently completed, and that will be leading edge for the next uh, uh, four or five years. 
But then again, with no additional investments in Europe, the risk is that Europe will be just non-relevant uh, in terms of, uh, of leading edge technologies for, for chips. So uh, Marco Ceccarelli already in his presentation highlighted all the reasons that drove uh, EU policymakers to, uh, to uh, propose this EU Chips Act, this new legislation. And uh, the focus of the, uh, of the EU Chips Act, particularly in Pillar 2, is on uh, bringing back production to Europe, right? And so, uh, in our view, uh, it has a lot of merits, this uh, EU Chips Act. And when it comes to production, there are three elements that I would like to, to emphasize today. The great focus on innovation. So the, the focus on first-of-a-kind facilities as a way to allocate also uh, investments where it is needed, so to fill the, the gaps in the, in, the, uh, in the supply chain, in the European semiconductor supply chain. The increasing role of government incentives uh, to make this happen. Uh, this is a way also to level the playing field because there's a cost disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other jurisdictions around the world. And there's a strong sense of urgency in the UCHIPS Act in, uh, the, uh, in the provisions that are linked to fast track permits and procedures. Uh, as you know, to build a fab, it takes three to four, four years. To fully equip it, it takes another year. Before a fab is fully operational, it takes some time. And so if also the, uh, the procedures uh, to authorize that, uh, that building take even more time, there's no, there's no chance for Europe to to try to, um, to try to approach the goal of 20% of global production by 2030. In my last slide, and I will be happy to, to discuss these points also during, during the panel, uh, how the future looks like and how Europe can try to make uh, uh, its semiconductor sector, its uh, semiconductor supply chain more resilient and more sustainable. Uh, there are some opportunities and challenges here. We need to strengthen the, the supply chain with more investments, uh, with uh, more investments also in the talent pipeline, and, and I know uh, the speaker for, for ST Micro uh, will, uh, will address this. Um, we need, uh, we need a stronger, more resilient supply chain. At the same time, as it was already mentioned, uh, we need more international cooperation with like-minded partners. There's no uh, way that Europe can create its own uh, semiconductor supply chain. And last but not least, it's really important that we, um, we couple the digital transition to the, to the green transition. And so all the objectives and all the commitments by companies like Intel, but in the, in the entire supply chain to uh, reduce uh, uh, consumption of energy, to uh, improve uh, uh, water, water treatment uh, um, and all the, other, all the other activities that are meant to reduce the footprint and actually increase the handprint and so uh, improve also uh, the, the performance uh, of uh, our industry, the semiconductor industry, but the entire industry uh, across the board. So thanks a lot. These were some thoughts uh, for you, and I hope we can discuss this further uh, later on. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Ricardo. I'm glad to see that at least we had a small technological miracle here today. So next on our speaker list is Hans M, Head of Supply Chain Innovations from Infineon Technologies, with his keynote on challenges and solutions in complex global supply chains. Pleased to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very glad uh, to talk to you about uh, challenges and solutions in global supply chain uh, with semiconductors. Um, you are showing the next slide. Well, I just see them here. The lead wall will not be bad as well. What do you think, tech team? Okay, maybe I just start. Uh, so maybe first a few words to myself. I'm from education, a physicist, a mechanical engineer. I have worked for 10 years in the wafer fab, so where the silicon wafers are done for lithography and wafer inspection. Also was running such a fab for production control. Uh, then I worked for 10 years in the assembly and test, as uh, that's where the chips are housed. And for a little bit more than 10 years, I'm working in supply chain and built up a supply chain innovations department. 
And uh, for this supply chain innovation, that's also uh, my speech, uh, what it's all about. Uh, I thought I'd make the presentation in uh, four steps. Uh, step one is the challenges which we have in semiconductors. Uh, the second one is uh, the usual solution uh, which we have for all those uh, challenges. Uh, the third one is that uh, something special came with uh, pandemic and the disruptions which we have and uh, how we overcome this special uh, disruption and the possibility to come out of this uh, global uh, chip shortage altogether, and then I come to an executive summary. Uh, maybe first about the challenges uh, which we have in semiconductor supply chain. Uh, this is on the one side, uh, semiconductor is very capital intensive, and thank you very much for your presentation. You showed it very much how capital intensive it, it is, and uh, there was major investment from Intel, uh, also investments from us, so we, uh, okay, we are back. So uh, very uh, expensive to in investment and compared to other uh, companies in the German uh, DAX company, we are the one with the highest appetite for money. Uh, second comes the so-called bullwhip effect. Uh, that is um, uh, that uh, uh, some small fluctuation outside amplify uh, for uh, the semiconductor market. So we always see much higher fluctuations and that is also one of the major reasons uh, of the chip shortage after uh, the pandemic. Uh, then, whenever you are in an industry where semiconductors play a major role, nothing is as before. So just look at camera industry, semiconductors came and you were happy at the beginning, you had semiconductors running nicely, but then the competitor was coming, was faster or in mobile phones, the competitor was coming, it's, everything moved faster. And we are right now there in the car manufacturing uh, area because a semiconductor disrupts its product itself because it's moving uh, so fast. And then a big challenge is uh, the intrinsic long uh, cycle time. All semiconductors, fabs in the world, run 365, seven days um, uh, a week. And it's uh, one process after the other. It takes three, four, sometimes six months, depending on the complexity. And this one cannot be parallelized. And I think that's uh, quite important. Now, now the global flexibility answer to social challenge. And uh, we have uh, found out that uh, we can benefit a lot from uh, considering our supply chain as one global virtual factory. And we have learned this from manufacturing uh, that when we um, run this as one global virtual factory, the whole supply chain, uh, we are in a much uh, better position. Uh, when I'm talking about that and when we come to the challenges, I also made here a picture of a, uh, of a, of a semiconductor set, a microprocessor. And if you, if you look at this small uh, red dot there and shoot out a little bit around, then uh, you see as a comparison a human hair and all the activity uh, being um, done in the semiconductor is here in the third dimension. So here you see the transistor, and here's the lines uh, where the electrons come in fast. So you can imagine this one you cannot parallelize, and because you cannot parallelize, we have to find ways uh, to overcome uh, this challenge, uh, which uh, mainly comes uh, with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with the bullwhip effect. And sometimes uh, when I'm asked if all needs to be so complex, uh, we also got some awards for uh, our supply chain. Uh, but uh, due to the sake of time, we, oh, we move maybe a little bit faster uh, to the current uh, challenge of the global uh, chip shortage. What I'm showing here is now again this bullwhip effect, and this picture is not new. Uh, this picture um, was already shown uh, quite some time ago, and you see two curves. You see on the one side the, gro the gross domestic product, how the gross domestic product is fluctuating. And on the other part, you see the semiconductor market. And you see that both are somehow in sync, uh, but um, the scale is quite different. The gross domestic product goes from minus 5 to plus 5%. The semiconductor market here from minus 70 to plus 70%. So this is the so-called bullwhip effect, the amplification of, um, of fluctuations. And uh, I think it's just in the nature of humans. Whenever you have nothing on stock, you order twice as much as you need. And when you have too much in stock, you order nothing. And uh, this one uh, actually happened after the COVID uh, situation. Uh, during COVID for automotive, there was, no, um, there was literally no, um, uh, no demand. 
And then, of course, the capacity was also going to other places. Um, obviously, there was more demand for uh, communication. And then um, uh, this um, uh, chip shortage happened. Now, if this is a root cause, what are the ways out? I think this is, of course, uh, much more important. Uh, maybe before we come to the way out, I probably some of you are from the uh, automotive industry. Just in time, for example, is one of these principles which was very, very strong. But just in time sometimes comes with uh, reach steered inventory. And uh, I would just give, like to give you an example. Imagine you have 1,000 stocks and you have 500 demand. If you divide that, then you have two weeks reach, right? 1,000 divided by 500 is two weeks reach. Now you reduce the demand by a factor of two to 250. Then you have four weeks reach, yeah? And if you replenish by two weeks reach, you would not replenish for another two weeks. So this you have already implemented uh, this uh, bullwhip effect. So we have to find ways uh, to overcome this bullwhip effect uh, to avoid uh, this chip shortage in the future. And we also have been asked uh, what is the possibility out, and we came up with this four-step approach. I think the step one is somehow trivial, wherever possible, uh, generate more inventory. Of course, also risky, because some of the inventory might not be needed in the past, in the future. A second one is uh, coming to an anonymous survey. Uh, it is when you, when today, when you, when you say your de demand, very often you have to amplify the demand to get at least some chips. Uh, and to take this out, an anonymous survey will help you uh, to, get, uh, to come to a truer demand, at least the incentive is gone to amplify. Uh, but this one, of course, you can only do on a very coarse level. Uh, you need to break it down, and there um, AI-based forecast on a semantic web is a very uh, promising uh, topic. A semantic web, I think you probably all know from Facebook, friend of a friend ontology, I know you, know also the others, or Google extending uh, the, the question already, or Amazon, or Amazon who buys that, also buys that. So the semantic web is very um, strong in B2C. In B2B it was not used so far because it is very uh, challenging also to build the semantic web up. Then uh, by doing that you could come to a um, a pull whip, um, more bullwhip free forecast, and then also uh, systems like you may know from, uh, from um, B2C as well, like um, revenue management in the airline industry. We call it here lead based pricing. So the one who has, has the forecast earlier and better, of course, pays less as the one who uh, comes, comes very late. And then maybe also underwriters come or insurance companies um, taking care uh, that uh, they take the risk uh, for more capacity. So this uh, four-step approach um, was already discussed in several parts now. So uh, the semantic web was developed in uh, EU Productive for Zero, which was a, a project with 100 companies uh, over three years there. Uh, the semantic web emerged. Uh, today with the semantically connected semiconductor supply chain, the semantic web is continued. And myself, I'm active in the Arbeitskreis just in time in Germany, the so VDR or the ZVE. And on international level, uh, we also discuss this uh, in the Microelectronic for Simulation and Manufacturing Conference, uh, where uh, also people from US are there, for example, John Fowler, which is very close to Intel, or uh, the Dachstuhl event, where Professor Chen Fu Chen is here, very close to TSMC. Um, it was also done, uh, an MIT hackathon was done, and uh, on July 11, um, um, the uh, EU Chips Act, uh, represented by UKTT and the US BIS, uh, also talked about that and um, uh, moving this direction. So that is, at the moment, the only uh, way that, where we think we can mitigate the bullwhip and also mitigate the chip shortage beyond, of course, all the investment. Uh, which is done, but better understanding, more transparency will reduce uh, this volatility. Now let me give you an executive summary. Uh, so we started up with uh, having the score model, then lean for complex flow manufacturing, flexibility in the make process, flexibility in the plan process, uh, then all the mergers work, and with the semantic web, we may come uh, to a sustainable end-to-end -end supply chain. And maybe the last slide, um, 
a better supply chain also ensures uh, better, uh, more chips. More chips help to have more uh, CO2 saving. We once looked how much uh, gram CO2 we need to build a, a chip and how much CO2 will be saved by the chip, only taking the chip's contribution, and we have a very high uh, positive factor. So it makes sense to think about a better supply chain, to think about more chips also for the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Last but not least, the keynote speaker of the day is Paolo Murari from ST Microelectronics, HR business partner, AMS Product Group, Group Rights President. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I see the slides here. Yeah. But if we can get them up here in the room. First of all, uh, let me introduce uh, the topic and, and myself. Uh, uh, I would like to tackle the topic of today from a different angle. I see that also from European level, the talent uh, and the skill shortage and upgrade was uh, uh, tackled at the beginning. So today, this will be the focus on my on my speech. I'm Paolo Murari. I work uh, in ST Microelectronics uh, in Agrat Brianza, a few uh, kilometers west to here. First of all, let me uh, introduce uh, slide, uh, shortly ST Microelectronics. Uh, we are one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world. We are European, French, and Italian uh, roots. Uh, we employ 48,000 people around the world, uh, more than 8,000 in R&D, both process and product uh, development. Uh, last year, revenues were $12.8 billion of revenues. This year, we are uh, reaching $16 billion with uh, a growth which is representing the market uh, share gain. We, have, uh, we are serving 200,000 customers around the world, from the biggest one to uh, also small and medium sized uh, companies. Uh, and we own, uh, we run, uh, and we invest into manufacturing, both front-end and back-end, uh, uh, both uh, in, in Europe and, the, and in Asia. We are also very active in the, uh, and, and we believe into the uh, sustainability uh, of, of our enterprise. And we are signatory of the UN uh, Global Compact uh, and uh, we are member of the Responsible Business Alliance. We are integrated device manufacturing. As was mentioned before, the business models in the semiconductor has split uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago between, uh, let's say, integrated uh, device manufacturing and uh, wafer uh, uh, fabless companies and uh, foundries. We are integrated and we believe this is a, a competitive advantage and we continue to keep this competitive advantage as, as an asset investing in, uh, uh, in manufacturing. Uh, we have uh, four fabs uh, in Europe under construction right now, different level of maturity, two in Italy and two in, uh, um, in France. And uh, with this uh, integrated device manufacturer, also in terms of supply chain and control of the supply chain, is key uh, in order to have a, a, a better control and a better security of, of supply. Being HR, I go on, on the HR numbers and KPIs. Uh, we uh, employ 48,000 people around the world. In uh, Italy and France, which is the focus of my talk, which is also the focus of, of today is, is about Europe. We employ more than 11,000 11, people in each country. Most of our activities there are advanced manufacturing, so the state-of-the-art manufacturing with the FEBS, and uh, product and process R&D. So also the kind of skills and the kind of talents that we are hiring uh, are uh, uh, aligned to this. And to give you a flavor, uh, uh, we are hiring more than 1,000 people every year both in Italy, in Italy and France, so 1,000 plus 1,000. These are the numbers that, uh, that we are hiring in, uh, in ST Microelectronics, Italy and France. So what, what is the current situation we are seeing uh, and we are experiencing on the, on the job market? And again, let me clarify that I'm talking about Italy and France where our footprint is, uh, is bigger. Uh, we have definitely a shortage of talents in uh, STEM, uh, STEM education, STEM experience, STEM competencies. And this is coming uh, from a different number of sources, different number of reasons. One is uh, the university and academia is not producing, quote unquote, uh, enough uh, engineers or enough, uh, um, let's say, uh, students with uh, STEM, uh, STEM competencies. This is also a matter of uh, 
attractivity of STEM studies uh, in the young generations. Eh? This morning they were mentioned, let's say, the competition that we have versus uh, uh, cooks or singers or, <laughs> or this kind of jobs for, uh, for, uh, for young, young people. Uh, also, academia is uh, somehow slow to update uh, the curriculum of studies uh, to the competence that, that we are needing. And apart from a few uh, examples, FBK is one of those, uh, the equipment, the labs, and the, and the infrastructure that is available at the university is uh, not state-of-the-art and is important that uh, engineers, uh, future engineers, they, they use their hands on, on, on state-of-the-art equipment. The few uh, examples that I know are uh, joint uh, collaboration between the industry and the university, like we did uh, uh, for STEM Electronics in both FPK at the beginning and uh, also Politecnico in Milano today. Then there is uh, a limited attractivity of uh, France and Italy for importing quote unquote uh, educated talents from other countries in the in the European Union or from other countries in the world. Uh, uh, people doing a university in, in other countries, they are flying to the US at first. If they come to, to Europe, they go probably to Germany before coming to Italy or, or to France. Uh, and uh, uh, also our people are going to, to Germany or to the US. Uh, and here are some uh, policies are in place, uh, but uh, we, we need more as well in order to retain, but also to attract and, and back uh, the, the, the talents that uh, were studying here and, and, going, and going somewhere else. And then the uh, last, uh, last point which uh, shaped the, the market of, of the work market today is uh, the remote work. After pandemic, uh, this was a taboo before, and the pandemic uh, broke the taboo. And, and right now is the new normal, and so the uh, players and the competitors in the in the job market uh, are uh, are different. There are different rules. Also, people they uh, they they consider this parameter as one part of the global offer. Uh, they they uh, evaluate when they accept or not accept a, a, a job. So. In ST, we, it's clear for us that uh, the talent shortage is uh, an additional point of concern, an additional uh, point where to invest, uh, not only in uh, the, uh, the infrastructure and the, in the financial capital and the technological capital of the company, but also in the human capital. And what, what are we doing? We are doing, uh, uh, let's say, f first of all, uh, we believe, uh, I believe that. Uh, Technical challenges are the main point of attraction for technical minds. Okay? If uh, you are able to provide a, a challenging project on a state-of-the-art equipment with a customer which is a high-tech uh, player, uh, people will uh, be interested and will stay in the, in the, in the company. So th really the job content uh, is, uh, is uh, the the main, uh, the main attraction point. Then continuous learning, uh, given the evolution of the technology, the, the, what we have learned today is, uh, is, uh, is useful for tomorrow, but not for the day after tomorrow. And uh, this uh, evolution is uh, with training on the job, but also with, uh, say, sharing uh, uh, knowledge and experience from, for example, our internal fellowship, fellows, and, and, technical, and technical staff. Internal mobility in a company like ST, but like Intel and like Infineon, you can move from one job to another and do a professional life changing and always refreshing yourself. University partnership and uh, uh, the initiative in the high school are investment in, in an early phase if we take uh, the VC language, right? So university partnership are multi multi-dimensional, uh, joint research project with our uh, engineers, with professors and students. Those students start to do thesis. Those stages become uh, uh, stage, and those stages become, uh, let's say, employment uh, employment offers. We fund scholarship, PhD, and postdoc in basically all uh, in, in university in Italy and France, but also in the U.S., also in Singapore, also in India and uh, and in China. We have also our um, engineers going to teach to the university, and we are designing curriculums, as it was mentioned before, in order to be sure that what the students study is, uh, is uh, aligned to what we need. And also we have a lot of initiatives in high schools where it's a very, very early stage when, where we um, 
where we explain uh, and, and we present ST and the STEM as an as a interesting future for students that are before they, they, they choose the, their academia and, uh, and we see this uh, on the territory that is bringing some, uh, some, um, some results. One last point that uh, let me grab two things is about storytelling because again it's uh, it's, it's uh, uh, say the manufacturing as a, as a job uh, and high tech as a job is interesting, and I think that there is uh, also a cultural gap. Here there are two books that just recently were published. Uh, one is last week, and the other one is last month. Uh, one is Cheap War, is the story of semiconductor in the in the U.S. Uh, by Chris Miller, and uh, Silicon Europe. Uh, as opposed to Silicon Valley, is uh, just recently published by, is in Italian, so just for Italian readers, uh, but it's the story of STM electronic uh, of uh, the semiconductor in Europe. So I, I urge also students and, uh, and players to take a look uh, at this, it's uh, is really, is really interesting. So the, um, just to conclude, uh, thank you again, and uh, basically it's uh, investment in the infrastructure, in investment in the wafer fab, but also investment in skills and talents, and it's not only short-term investment, it's long-term investment, and uh, the fabrication of uh, chips uh, inside the wafer fab needs to be coupled also with the fabrication of uh, talents in the university and in the research uh, uh, partners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo, and another big thank you to all our keynote speakers that were outstanding, besides and regard of all the technical issues we had. So with this, we closed the sequence of the keynotes, and I announced the panel session of the event and the day and its moderator, Gianluca Griffi, the business creation manager of IT Manufacturing South. He will be guiding us through the topic of resilient supply chains for the European manufacturing industry. That's it. Thank you. And I'd like to be clear, we do not have any presentation, so no technical <laughs> issue can stop us this afternoon. So you've been hearing about uh, uh, policymakers and semiconductor suppliers, in a way the bad guys, the guys that co are re behind the, sh the chip shortage. It's not that simple, of course. In this panel, we're going to deep dive a little bit. We have a representative of the industry, and we hear from them what is going on from their perspective, and how can we reconcile and build a bridge between these two worlds. And I'd like to introduce, first of all, Mr. Federico Menna from EIT Digital, Interim Chief, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operations and Finance. Thank you. Thank Please you take a seat. <laughs> and again, we have one of those uh, so-called bad guys, <laughs> Riccardo Masucci. We just heard him, and I'd like him to deep dive a little bit more about some of the topics that he touched. Uh, Ricardo is the Director of Security and Technology Policy at Intel. And we're moving now towards the industry, and we are very happy to welcome Ms. Daphne Danielson, Global Public Policy Lead at Philips. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Next, Mr. Giacinto Carullo, who is the Chief Procurement and Supply Chain Officer at Leonardo. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Alessandro, where is it? Alessandro Rolet, thank you. He was <laughs> left without a chair. <laughs> nice to have you here. Alessandro is the Automotive Business and Development Unit Director at Eltec. And Roberto Saracco, Senior Advisor at Reply and a former executive at um, Telecom Italia. And so, as we said, um, before we pass the, the, the microphone or the, the stage to the, to the industry, we'd like to deep dive a little bit more on the ecosystem and on the impact of uh, uh, the talent shortage. So we just heard it from, um, from, um, from Paolo, from ST Microelectronics. I'd like to hear from now Federico. So with reference to the EU Chips Act, you know, what is the impact of skill acquisition and talent shortage in Europe? What is the expected uh, impact with regards to, you know, to the reshoring activity in Europe? Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm from EIT Digital, which is a sister organization to EIT Manufacturing. And I think in the first presentation, uh, there was a statement from President von der Leyen saying there's no digital without chips. Uh, and that's true. Uh, it's even 
what we are seeing now in the chips is what we observed in other industry in the, in, in the digital domain uh, or in other technology linked to digital, like uh, cybersecurity, AI, the mobile industry, where we slowly uh, started lagging behind uh, with, the, with respect to the rest of, of the world uh, as, as Europeans. And when I look at the chips, uh, this is even worse uh, because the chips are both an enabler for digital, but the chips are also an industry in itself. So we have uh, two dimensions to address. Uh, the, the statement was also talking about uh, technical, technological sovereignty. And I would say there's no techn technological sovereignty without skills and without talents. And I really liked the presentation from, S from Paolo from ST before because it was touching upon all the aspects that we at ET Digital see when we analyze the trends and we are in the middle between the, uh, the decision makers at the European Commission, uh, research, we are also partner of FBK and industry, we are also partnering up with ST Microelectronics and what we observe is that there's indeed a shortage of talent and in my opinion there are three uh, main priorities when we look uh, at that. The first one is uh, we have strong academic uh, track records in Europe, but very often these track records do not materialize in, into the industry. And also, slowly, we observe, and I think it was in the first uh, slide of Paul as well, uh, we observe that curricula are not updated. So these are becoming outdated more and more. So the first priority would be to, uh, to start uh, and urgently modernize the curricula at all levels, not only university. We need to, to start uh, doing that in uh, <coughs> primary school, in secondary school. Uh, and also the upskilling. Uh, it's not only about uh, those that are coming out of the universities, but professionals also need to be reskilled. I think 10 years ago or even less, everybody was saying that uh, technology was killing jobs. And now we don't have the people to work, so it's quite quite different from what uh, we were uh, thinking. So it's really important not to forget to upskill and reskill our professionals. The second element is that we need to act uh, at an uh, ecosystem level. We see a fragmented landscape when we look at, uh, especially at Europe, uh, between the public and the private education. We have really good examples, but somehow they don't work together. They work in isolation. And we, we cannot uh, achieve that by uh, doing this uh, on our own. So we, we really have to, to have the two worlds uh, working together. And the third, which is connected to this one, is that the public, uh, at ET Digital, we, call, we, call, we always have this ambivalism between the makers and the shapers, and I, I like that makers was also mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, the shapers, so the European Commission, but not only the, the Commission, but also the member states, need to invest uh, in that, need to support the development. We will not get back the industry just by relying on the, on the private investments. So the, Doing it in hand in hand uh, may uh, bring uh, the, the, our, uh, let's say, chips manufacturing in, uh, in Europe, but it takes time. So it's really important to, uh, to, to start early and to start soon. And it's refreshing to see that in the first presentation, the representative from the Commission uh, mentioned a very clear uh, timeline for, for the development of the Act and its implementation. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my short summary. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, uh, let's move now back to um, semiconductor supplier, to Ricardo. So thank you for your presentation earlier, uh, for outlining the situation and the risk that we have in Europe, that if we don't uh, act now by 2026, 27, we will have no leading edge semiconductor industry anymore in Europe, at least in front end uh, capability. Um, so can you deep dive a little bit, so from the theory or the scary scenario in a way, uh, how can we then uh, act? What is going on? What is happening in Intel? And I believe uh, similar measures are taken by other semiconductor suppliers. So what are you guys doing to help the industry? Sure. Um, well, as you, as you saw in my, in my presentation earlier, the, the focus should really be on bringing back uh, production capacity uh, in Europe. Uh, the, the scenario that I that I described today uh, with uh, with that graph is the result of of long term trends no in the market uh, the the fact that there's a, there was a steady decline in Europe on, in uh, in manufacturing is due to a number of factors I mentioned 
the new business models, Fablight and Fabless uh, uh, companies uh, that are outsourcing actually manufacturing to to other players, namely all or almost all in uh, uh, in Asia. Um, there, there was also uh, a dramatic change in the in the industrial landscape in Europe over the past 20, 30 years because there are some consumer electronics OEMs that are not anymore producing those. Uh, uh, those consumer electronics, if you think of the brands of your phones 20 years ago, they are not the same as today. And, uh, and then there is another, an, another very important element, which is uh, the role of government incentives. Today, uh, manufacturing in uh, Europe or manufacturing in the US can be, depending on, uh, on, on the jurisdiction, depending on, uh, on the competitive location in Asia, um, it can be 30, 40, 50 percent more expensive, and the majority of this extra cost is not given by operational costs like labor, but it's mainly given by uh, government incentives because over the years, uh, countries in, uh, in Asia have uh, developed some, some industrial policies and strategies to attract more investments in the semiconductor sector. So how to revert all these trends? Uh, this is the, the question that that the semiconductor industry, and not just Intel, uh, is, uh, is raising. Definitely, as I said from the beginning, production in Europe is, uh, is of utmost importance, but it's not just this segment of the uh, semiconductor supply chain. We need to invest more in design. Uh, Europe is doing excellent work uh, already in uh, uh, R&D but we need to uh, decrease the distance from R&D to scale production, what also the European Commission refers to as from lab to fab, you know, the, the time and, and the resources to make uh, innovation then available at, at large scale. Um, and, and also uh, Europe is, is, doing, is doing very well in fab equipment and I mentioned already some, some suppliers that are, that are really world class uh, in terms of, uh, of products. Um, I, uh, I think international cooperation is another very important part of, uh, uh, of the picture and uh, the US uh, and Europe are probably you know, the, uh, the closest partners in, in, in that perspective because uh, policymakers uh, have come up with similar proposals, the US Chips Act, the EU Chips Act. Budgets are not really the same, uh, to, be <laughs> to be honest. Um, because uh, a lot of this, it's also linked to, to real investments and execution of, sure. of the priorities. But nevertheless, uh, US and EU are facing similar uh, challenges. And so uh, we, we look at TTC, the Transatlantic uh, uh, Tech and Trade Council, uh, as an opportunity also to increase uh, communication, coordination between the EU and the US, uh, to avoid also situations where, uh, like recently with the inflation, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the, there were some, some tensions linked to the production of uh, electric vehicles. Um, I think these are... Oh, maybe the, the, the last point I, I had in mind that I wanted to point out. It's, it's not just the semiconductor supply chain. We probably need to have a much broader reflection on all the supply chains, all the industrial supply chains. And so very much linked to uh, the semiconductor supply chain is also the, the raw material supply chain. And so the European Union has come up with, uh, with a new proposal on the uh, critical raw materials, um, the critical raw materials act. Uh, and, it's, and it's again very apparent the fact that there are huge dependencies on some regions of the world. 60% uh, of lithium is processed in China. 90% of rare, uh, rare earths are processed in China. And so Europe and, and the rest of the world are depending on one country or one specific geography for, for some essential elements for, for the entire industry. So a lot of work to do, but I think we are, we're going in, in the right direction. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So we heard now, until now, we heard about uh, the point of view of the semiconductor suppliers, measures in place, EU chips act and so on and so forth. Now it's time to, uh, to pass the microphone to the industries. And here we have representatives of three of the most important industrial sector in, uh, in Europe, or in the world. Um, representative of the medical technology industrial sector, space, aerospace and defense, and automotive. Now, all combined, these three sectors account for about 10% of the chips demand. 
So it doesn't really make sense, you know, where the 90% of demand goes elsewhere. But actually, it makes a lot of sense to have them here for a number of reasons. Uh, we've been speaking so far about the reshoring high-end, leading-edge technologies. But actually, we also need to reshore mature technologies, which are the ones needed in uh, longer projects or applications such as the ones in these sectors. But also, um, the requirement uh, in terms of reliability and quality of the automotive industry, space, aerospace, defense, medical, is so high, they, they act as a sort of debugger of the technology. They are late adopters, and they debug the technology. So they have a, a very peculiar point of view with regards to the huge chipsets. So yes, great investments in reinsuring or um, no, investing in, in wafer fabs with um, sub-micron uh, or nanometer technology and so on. But what about the rest? What about secure supply? What about uh, uh, mature technologies? What about reliability and quality? And so I would like to hear and involve, first, first of all, Ms. Daphne, Daphne Dennison uh, from Philips Medical Technology, the medical technology sector from Philips. So what is your point of view now? How do you see, what was the impact in Philips about this shortage in the past three years? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, if you allow me, I'll say a few words about Philips Please. first for context, because I think everybody knows Philips, <coughs> um, whether it's your TV set, a radio, a CD player, um, your, your domestic devices, uh, the air fryers, the blenders, what have you. Mm. Um, light bulbs, of course, and yes, we have worked on all those innovations over the past 130 years. But um, in the last 10 years, we have completely transformed the company. And at this point in time, we are a dedicated health technology company. So all the other products you will still find in the shops, but those are all under brand license. So I'm representing Philips here, but medical technology is basically all we do these days. So that being said, um, I don't need to convince this audience, I think, of the importance of, of chips and the role they play in our, our modern life as they enable basically all technologies that we all use day in, day out. Um, but a story that we don't hear very often is the impact on the medical device industry and not just the medical device industry, but basically the, the health sector at large. So. I would like to thank EIT for giving me the opportunity today to, um, to share that story and some of the, the, the consequences and challenges that we are facing. Because the impact of the global ship shortage for the medtech sector has been tremendous. Um, I think over the past year, um, we have really been struggling in securing allocation of chips. And I also need to clarify that basically until a year, 18 months ago, um, we were not really concerned about semiconductor chips because we don't purchase them. We buy components that contain chips. So once we were faced with these use shortages, we really had to dig down into our supply chain, tier three, tier four, to see what was happening and what the challenges were that they were facing. And in the meantime, uh, we were faced with the constant risk of lines being down um, not being sure where we got our components from, lead times ballooning to 52 weeks, sometimes we're even up to 78 weeks, which make it very difficult to plan. And of course, this is not just Philips, this is the entire industry. And that is bad for us, but actually it's bad for everybody. Because without the devices and the technologies that we produce, we cannot deliver healthcare. So just to give a few examples, this impacts devices like ultrasound that is used to monitor the development of an unborn baby, um, patient monitoring that's used in the intensive care units to monitor the vital signs of people, um, but also defibrillators that are used in uh, sudden cardiac arrest. So basically, it affects all of us. And... Um, so going forward, that means that we're struggling to really manufacture those devices that we desperately need in healthcare. And it's not just the new devices, it's also servicing and maintaining the devices that are already out there, because we need the components in order to be able to do that. So we're constantly at risk that we really need to tone down the delivery of care, and that our customers, the hospitals, end up rationing care. 
And this is in a situation where the healthcare sector is already facing numerous challenges. So we see the um, number of chronic diseases increasing because of aging. Um, we have huge challenges when it comes to, it's another um, HR issue, but also in healthcare, we cannot find we cannot find the nurses, we cannot find the doctors, so there are huge staff shortages and the people that are still working in the system are struggling. Now the good news is that um, we can meet those challenges by digitalization of healthcare, whether it's through telehealth, um, through improving the workflow of hospitals, or by using AI and getting to precision diagnosis. But whatever we do, all those solutions require chips. So going forward, if we want to make sure that we don't derail that transformation because of a global ship shortage, we need to act. And like you said, our industries are very specific because we rely on mature chips. So EU Chip Act is great. We support it strongly because we think we need to work on the, the strategic strength of the EU, but it cannot just be about leading edge. We also need these mature chips for all these industries, because um, when I look at the medical devices that we make, um, it has a very long development time in, in, in development, um, so that could take up years. So by the time we actually start designing the device, it may still be leading edge. By the time we go to market, three, four years later, already not leading then these devices are in the market for another 15 years. We need to service those devices. So we really need those mature chips. So I think that is one of the main messages that I would like to give today is that, yes, great, we need the leading edge, we need to innovate, but don't forget about these mature chips. Because without it, it's not just industries, but also many parts of society that will struggle going forward. Maybe I'll leave it at that for now, because oh, I can absolutely. keep on going. <laughs> No, as I said, absolutely. Um, basically, uh, those are chips that go into life-saving machines for us or diagnostic machines for us. And in the semiconductor industry, it's common practice to offshore mature technologies from Europe to low-cost countries, even wafer fabs, as soon as they are very mature. And actually, it would give us a little bit of a, you know, discomfort, let's call it this way. So when we talk about uh, reshoring leading edge technology, we should not forget mature technologies, or at least reducing the outbounding, outsourcing of uh, mature technologies. And uh, Daphne, you mentioned 10, 15 years in service, and uh, you mentioned life-saving devices. Then our next guest is maybe three or four times that time frame. <laughs> And actually, you don't really want to be in an airplane that is having some sort of failures. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm uh, very pleased to involve now Giacinto as representative of Leonardo, space, aerospace, and defense. So what is your perspective with regards to existing products and products in development? Are there different conditions or same? So what is your point of view? Thank you very much. Um, for Leonardo, I mean, that's for the industry. The, uh, I think all the industry, we are sharing the same pain, of course. Um, new technology, all of us are really engaged because uh, we are a really technological company. We, uh, st we work for innovation. We work wor with them to define the new application in a very difficult environment, the aviation, the aerospace. So you need to find also new solution to, to uh, secure the the utilization and the new technology for the future. Of course, uh, all of this will be embedded in the new plants, the new facility that will be um, built in the next years. So there is an estimation that is going to consider that number of, uh, uh, of uh, overall worldwide uh, fab it will move from uh, 140, 150 this year to 200 in the next in the next five years, so 10, 10 plants per year. But these 10 plants per year are not built in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, And these 10 plants per year will, now have not, will be uh, dedicated to the mature nodes, but will be dedicated for sure to the new technology, because if you have to invest a lot of money, you will inv invest the money on the new technology. But uh, uh, taking an example for us, if you study a technology today, 
the implementation for us is in six years' time. If you do the same for automotive we discussed before, it's five years' time. So, uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, we need to produce and we need to do uh, our products. So, how we react in Leonardo? Uh, first of all, let me say that our industry was lucky. We uh, count one percent out of the the six hundred. Uh, billion that we've seen before, uh, and they're going to one trillion. And, but this uh, uh, few volumes were uh, secure because during the pandemic period, the industry were considered, even uh, yours, but were considered strategic, uh, and we were not uh, um, cancelling order. We were not uh, uh, leaving people at home. I mean, when I say we, means uh, industry, not just, uh, just Leonardo. So this allowed us to have uh, guaranteed uh, production and parts, uh, for sure, with additional lead time. So that was delaying uh, the, the delivery, but at least we had it. So we managed with uh, action, like uh, uh, tightening the relationship with the suppliers, uh, uh, giving them more visibility, speaking with uh, the, the big player and final, and final agreement, because also for them it's important to have the long-term vision other than the volatility that we discussed before with Infineon and colleagues that was explaining the bull whip effect. No? So there is a value for them, and they were securing uh, uh, our, our production. <laughs> but at the end, the, this phenomenon is not going to finish in one year or two years. Uh, so we are struggling a little bit. So uh, if all factories will go at, at the run at rate that we suspected, uh, at additional two, three years will, uh, will be needed. But again, the shortage on the mature node will stay there. So we need to find a way with the partnership agreement, with uh, uh, collaboration, with connection, to fix arrangement to secure this uh, uh, machine. So we took machine node, we took um, uh, chips that are in the range uh, from uh, 40, mm, in, in that range, uh, 20 to, to 50 to 70 nanometers. So it's a technology that is uh, the technology that we are using today, basically. So, um, so out of curiosity, what is the most leading edge technology, critical dimension today? We're talking about six nanometers or four? E even below. If, even uh, three. below. Uh, now, okay. five Rockman nanometers, is in, is, I think, is in scale So approaching production. the light wind. And, and three nanometers is the, the, next, uh, the next dimension in terms of... Uh, Okay, three because nanometers versus density. 60 nanometers. Yeah. Give you an idea of. Uh, and the U is Chips Act is working in the direction of the small one, right? Oh. Not only? So, uh, <laughs> the one thing, one myth that I would like, if, yeah. if I can, uh, so, so it, we no, make please, it also more, more interactive. It is true that at the very beginning, uh, Commissioner Breton was emphasizing a lot the fact that Europe was lagging behind in terms of um, leading edge technologies and was saying, we want to bring two nanometers. To Europe. But then, uh, if you look at the definition of first of a kind uh, in the EU Chips Act, uh, it says uh, uh, innovation has to be uh, brought in terms of um, miniaturization of chips, but also in terms of uh, uh, any inno innovative improvements in terms of process, performance, and so it can be even uh, a very mature chip sure. that is much more energy efficient than another technology before. So. There's room um, uh, with this. Uh, we know that the situation is way complex, and yep. it will require a lot of fubs to, to completely address the demand and, and the different needs of the market. But there is still an opportunity there for investors to invest in mature technologies that are more advanced than those existing. Well, okay. Thank you just very to, much. Just to clarify. No, thank you very much. <laughs> for so that's the good news. So sorry to, to, to interrupt for interrupting you, but there's hope at least. We're not not going to resolve everything now here in this panel, but at least sure. we share information, which is the most important. Can I, can I comment already? Please, okay. of course. Yeah, because you are absolutely right about what the EU Chip Act states, that the first of the kind has to be innovative, and it doesn't yeah. have to be just note size. But that being said, as an OEM, I'm still concerned, because yes, the opportunity is open to get support for other innovative manufacturing than node size, 
but I'm not completely reassured that the manufacturers will actually take that opportunity because like was being said, what is actually interesting to invest in is that high end, high volume. So it's there on paper, the opportunity is there, but there's no guarantee that that is actually going to be where the subsidies are headed. So it's a nice opening, but I'm not bringing out a bottle of champagne just yet. No, you know, the, the Today, the, the opportunity is in the volume that are outside Europe. You know, because there is, for instance, the SMC that is investing in China, by the way, or the mature technology. Mm. So, um, and something is moving, but it's not finished. So, we will be, we will have, as soon as we will have the sovereignty in Europe, uh, we will be in a much safer condition. But it's not now, it will be in short time. So, we need to continue to do our job in the supply chain to secure uh, the, the production in uh, the standard way until the new, uh, the new opportunity will come. Very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. And before I introduce Alessandro, uh, I would like to make a statement. I sympathize a lot with this position because in my years in, uh, in Estimac Electronics, I used to work with tier one suppliers of automotive and industrial. And Altec is just that. It's a tier one supplies, if you too before don't purchase directly semiconductor devices, they do. And they are between the anvil and the hammer. I don't know if this expression can be translated in English, <laughs> but it's like they're right in the middle because they have, rightly so, a screaming customer from one end and a non uh, or not so responding supplier in some cases. And we're talking about automotive where there are some volumes, some decent volumes not only their volumes so this differently from, uh, uh, they represent 7, 8% of total demand, you know, the space aerospace industry and the medical tech industry represent each 1%. But this is also the last heavy industry in Europe. So any shortage, any issue in automotive, have immediately a social impact, well before the financial impact, or together with the financial impact. And who's in the middle of all this storm? Alessandro, so <laughs> oh. lucky you. So, <laughs> first of all, thank you. So very please much. express your frustration. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm here to express my frustration. Thank you very much. So uh, I am anyway also here between the hammer and the anvil because I have a Leonardo and I have a Roberto Saracco, who is uh, a legend, a guru of, uh, of the microchips and so on. But anyway, I, I tell you a little bit my story because everybody knows uh, Philips, everybody knows ST, everybody knows Leonardo, but who knows Eltec? So Eltec is a typical excellence of Italy. It's a mid-sized company that is making sensors. Sensor and uh, Altec, let me say, 12 years ago, I joined Altec. I'm working in automotive uh, for more than 30 years, and uh, 12 years ago, I joined Altec. And uh, we focused uh, on the emissions reductions. So today, Altec was uh, uh, producing a special pressure sensors that are used in the SCR systems. Who knows what, he has, uh, what the SCR system is? If you drive a diesel car with AD Blue, you have an SCR system in your car. And you have, uh, for sure, an LTEC sensor in your car because it's the worldwide standard due to a patent anti-freezing that this company was able to design during the years. So these are the typical creativity and fantasy of uh, some Italian industries that are not so known, by the way. And uh, we have never stopped to, to invest uh, in the emission reduction, so we are now putting a lot of money Okay, with our limits because we are not so big. So the LTEC is uh, 1,600 people for uh, more than 200 million euro turnover. So I am a little bit uh, between the anvil and the hammer again. So, so <laughs> it's not so easy to. Anyway, um, we are putting a lot of money in the hydrogen, and uh, because we bet on the hydrogen more than on the pure battery. And we, what we do, we make sensors. So we use. Uh, microchips, we put these microchips in our electronics, we put the electronics with our software in the sensor, and we sell to the automotive industry. And uh, so, uh, when my colleagues were uh, starting to talk, it was, for me, more and more difficult to say, now, now what, I, what I can say that has not been already told by them. So, uh, but I would like to tell you which is today, after a, a tremendous year that was 2021, uh, the, uh, the life in the shortage, that, uh, the practical life was really very difficult because uh, 
first of all, the lead time. For us, the typical lead time of a microchip, of even for a small resistor or capacitor, was 52 weeks. So when I go to the OEMs asking, sorry, can you please give me, uh, with the pandemic, with the geopolitical disruption, with so the war, everything, can you give me the, the, your forecast for the next year? They uh, start laughing and say, I have not the crystal ball, get out of here. Uh, so out of curiosity, for the, audience, <laughs> for the sake of the audience, before this crisis, what was the lead time of a resistor? was a still a still decent lead time of uh, three, six months. And then... Uh, three months. Three months. So it's four times. Like yeah. Multiplied by four. And now it's uh, really, really uh, something that uh, is challenging us a lot, or unless you put uh, everything in the in, in a warehouse, but uh, you cannot put microchips in the warehouse for years. So it's uh, something that uh, has to be managed day by day. Then, uh, what do you do? If you, if you don't have these, uh, these microchips available, you have to make the production because you have to sign the contract with the OEMs. And if you sign the contract with the OEMs, you have to grant for the production continuity, otherwise you are killed immediately. <laughs> so, so, maybe not. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 uh, <laughs> so at least you this. have to participate <laughs> to daily telephone conference where you have to explain, do you have done everything that was uh, useful to find all these microchips on the market. Yes, I did it, but I also did it on the, on the let me say, parallel market of the distributors, or on the internet. I look on Google, please give me this, and I, I, you can also <laughs> find fake components. Oh, yes. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> this is something that is really destroying uh, everything, because otherwise you go to your OEMs and say, I have this that is similar to, <laughs> to what you are using. Yes, please, start the validation test. After the one year, we can talk again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. But anyway, we well, have, actually, first of all... you're not kidding, I know it. Uh, it's it's <laughs> like that, but uh, sometimes... Uh, I even had car makers <laughs> going to, uh, to my customer telling, no, you can buy the device there, you can go there. Here's the name of a distributor. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that, that's a lot of fun, and this is my life. I like to do that, so I do it with passion and so on. But anyway, um, what is uh, something that has also to be addressed is the legal situation. Because uh, I, I see that, for example, in China, uh, the government, uh, when the demand was uh, so high after the pandemic, pandemic uh, gave really the priority, made a lot of pressure so on the foreign company and, and uh, gave priority to the Chinese one. So you have to, you, if you have to buy a Chinese car during that time, lead time was normal, was uh, two months, three months, but if you have to, to, to buy a foreign car, you can wait for one, one and a half year. So some plants uh, of OEMs in China closed for uh, some, some, some while, for, for some period. So it was a really, really uh, a, a difficult, a tough time. Today is a little bit better. I think that uh, Chips Act is uh, helping, will help, we hope so. But uh, anyway, it was not, uh, was not uh, something easy to manage. And that's it. So I think that uh, in the future, <laughs> for sure, uh, as been already told uh, several times, uh, the car itself, but we are not uh, only looking on cars, uh, we, are, uh, we call ourselves also mobility, so we are also looking to aerospace. And uh, we, we are moving to a new generation of sensors. So you know, the, the, um, the, the power of these microchips is uh, for sure, uh, I know that uh, I've discussed already with Roberto, the size and the technology of these uh, microchips is old in the automotive. And uh, for sure in the future, probably uh, the innovation will, uh, will also come and we need to uh, evolve uh, the use of the approved microchip for the automotive that not all are approved today. So basically this is the scenario and this is uh, what happened with the shortage and the life during the shortage of microchips. So this is uh, everything that uh, I have uh, to, uh, to tell to you today, uh, but I am uh, available for any of your questions. Thank you very much. Well. <laughs> so <laughs> this is... <laughs> Taking a hand to your frustration, I suppose. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, I, actually, a lot of empathy. Thank you very much. <laughs> you understand myself. <laughs> but actually, if you want to go and you want to buy a new car right now, Volkswagen, any European brand, but even non-European, lead time is what, 12 months, one year, maybe even more. And uh, now you know why. It's not because there's a, a chip with embedded AI or memory or whatever missing. It's for a resistor missing or a capacitor most of the times. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, that doesn't mean that we should not uh, we should focus only on uh, on uh, on uh, passive components. But this is also we have to look at the whole supply chain, all the bill of material and everything. And now, <laughs> my dear Roberto, uh, we need you to shed some light <laughs> to understand <laughs> what can be, or at least where we're leading, where we're heading. Uh, is it going to get better? Are we going to build enough capacity? in your opinion or not? How is the, the market trend is going or the technology trend is leading? Okay, well, thank, thanks for having me. Um, I used to fly a lot, and I think Gianmario can confirm that. And, but of course, with the pandemic, I stopped flying, basically, like most of us, I would say. Coming spring, coming this spring, okay, the, the world turned around and I started to, to fly again, but I didn't fly the flights. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and when I book a flight, they cancel it, okay? So they, they will send me a message saying, oh, your flight is no longer there, you know, because of the pandemic. Even though the pandemic is fading away, in a sense, okay, or at least that's what we are told, uh, the f all the flights are being disrupted. Why I'm saying this? Because I want to make the point that it's not just the semiconductor supply chain. It's everything. And why is it everything? Because we are designing our processes to be sustainable dollar-wise or euro-wise, okay? So the first thing that airlines did when they discovered there's no more traffic, they stop, okay? They just dismiss people and stop flying. And in, in that particular sector, actually, there were some regulation that forces la airline to fly a little bit to keep the slots. So you had this flight moving back and forth without passengers. In the semiconductor industry, it's worse because there's not such a regulation, okay? So company, quite simply, they, they stop ordering chips. And on the other side of the production side, company said, well, they are no longer ordering. What should I do? Oh, by the way, the consumer electronics is going up. So let's move to consumer electronics. But it's not like that, okay? It takes time to move a chip from one market to another one. We got these 14 nanometers that is basically considered the dividing uh, line between the advanced chip below that, and you guys announced your roadmap going to 1.8 nanometers by 2025. Why 1.8? Because AMD announced two <laughs> nanometers. So they say, oh, we're far better, 1.8. Uh, <laughs> it, will, it will take time, but, it, but, it, but it's coming. Now, whatever is above the 14 nanometers is all the stuff, okay? But it's the old stuff that these ladies and gentlemen are saying, well, it's the one that we're using it, okay? So when Europe, Europe is saying, oh, we need to regain the leading edge, okay? Looking at this kind of thing, okay? Yes, it's something but it's not going to solve the problem. I don't think that any action is going to solve the problem. Why? Because it's just putting a patch on something. Unless we are rethinking the whole process, it's not going to work. Because if you're listing down all the reasons why this shortage happened, you'll discover that the semiconductor industry is an over-constrained industry. Because it, it's, it has to operate within this competition environment, within this euro-based or dollar-based environment. So it's basically all constrained, and you cannot solve it. I was talking last week in, in, uh, uh, in Vancouver, the board of the IEEE with the president of the uh, Electronic Packaging Society. And she was telling me, well, we have to rethink the whole sector. We have to step back, look outside of the box, and think how can we include flexibility into this kind of thing. And it goes much farther than includes flexibility in just the supply chain. You've got to include flexibility in these guys using the chip. If you don't get a particular component, can you be flexible enough in your production to use a different component? Today, the answer is no, okay? Because there's voltage or limits. You, you can't just swap a, one chip with the other because there are software limits and so on. Now, if you take the automotive industry, Automotive industry is basically about putting together a bunch of things that are produced by different companies without control, basically. Okay? A car today has over 100 million 
called lines of code. An airplane has fewer. Why is that? Because an airplane is designed more in a top-down fashion. A car is just designed, in fact, oh, I need this, you can provide me that, and there's an operating system for that, there's an application for that, and I need this for you, and there's another operation system. A communication right? protocol for a communication protocol. Yes. So it's more and more. Now, the standardization today is at the bus level, okay? You need to have a bus level, and every, everything has to, to start there. We used to have the same issue with the images. You might remember, if you were in that area, in the 90s, there was the MPEG standards, the JPEG developed, and what was the goal of JPEG? The fact that if you take a picture, you can read it, okay? You can still read it. Well, that standard basically fade away. Yes, you have JPEG picture, Every, everybody of us have JPEG picture. But if you take a camera today, if you take a phone today, taking a picture, okay? Well, that picture is not coded in JPEG. It's coded in that particular sensor standard. And then you have a software that converts that standard into JPEG. So basically, we have got rid of the need for a fixed standard through software. We have inserted flexibility at a different level. So this is something that should be considered probably by the industry. And this uh, lady from the EPS was telling me probably digital twin, we have heard about digital twin this morning, can help in doing this kind of thing. Let's transfer flexibility to the cyberspace where flexibility exists and then go back into the physical space. But that is not enough. We should also insert flexibility at the level of production. Our friends Intel and AMD and all the other NVIDIA and so on, okay? They are today producing chips that are basically 90%, they are not used. You've got billions of transistors there, how many are really used? It depends on the application. Depends on the application. Right. So today I'm using this kind of program. I'm using that little, little part of chip, OK? And they've got so smart to say, OK, since they are not used, I just power them off, OK? So most of the time, to save power, I shut off part of the chip and I'm just using a little bit, OK? Well, if this kind of thinking goes inside the design of the chip, then we're going to have flexibility also on the other side of the supply chain so that they can be made usable in different ways. And we haven't spoken today about the EDA, but it's a crucial part, okay? The electronic design automation. And today is basically USA to companies that are, and Siemens were, were acquired the uh, mentor graphic from US, <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> and these are the ones. And we have a, a huge advantage over China. Even though China sent their, their people uh, to US to work in these companies, now they, are, they got them back and they're trying to, to chase the thing. But it's, it's very crucial to have this control. The chip is something that has a very long value chain up, okay? It's not just the, the little piece at the end. And we need to invest in this kind of thing to introduce uh, flexibility there. And actually, I feel that artificial intelligence is going to be a crucial thing in helping this kind of design. Already chips are too, way too much complex for being designed by a human pe person, okay? So you need to have artificial intelligence. Europe should invest a lot, a lot more, in making this flexibility in the overall design, not just in a single piece. So this is basically my message. If we want to get out of the mess, we should look outside of the box. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's not really much more to add unless uh, anybody else on the panel would like to comment on that. I think we are a little bit early, but I think it's perfect to stop here now because we, I believe, I hope that we have shed some light on the, on the issue, at least understand the complexity, the complexity of the needs of the industry and of the semiconductors. And thank you so much also, Roberto, for, you know, putting everything together and giving us a, a bird's eye view of the issue. So thank you very much. And please, if you want to join back your seats, we will uh, going to end with, uh, with Gianmario. Maggio. Okay. Thank you. No question.
Thank you. Please, John Mario. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Please. Thank you, Gianluca. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation and also the subsequent uh, discussions. So just a few takeaway messages that I got from my side uh, uh, from the discussion today. So it is clear that we, ne we need uh, to create a strong uh, European chip ecosystem that includes uh, world-class research, uh, design and production capacity, but also to have uh, uh, to foster also the uh, SMEs and especially startups that can bring innovation into this, uh, into this ecosystem. Also, uh, it has emerged that we need uh, more manufacturing capacity that helps uh, to increase the supply chain resilience uh, and public support uh, is instrumental for making this happen in the European Union. But we also heard, however, that uh, not only we need uh, leading edge, which is supported clearly by the uh, European Chips Act, uh, but also mature technologies are still key to sustain uh, also uh, existing applications. Such some of these are also life critical, so we better make it b uh, well well served. Uh, also, we heard that uh, talent uh, there's not just a chips shortage; we are facing a talent shortage issue. So building infrastructure is not uh, just uh, sufficient. We need to develop skills as well in the high-tech manufacturing industry, including R&D and including product design skills. And uh, when it comes to the supply chain, we also learned that the smart management, for, for instance, relying on artificial intelligence, uh, can result uh, in a competitive advantage for companies. So we, we saw some uh, clear examples from industry. So, Finally, I would like to thank uh, all our distinguished speakers today, also for making room in your, in your busy agenda and be here today. So maybe let's thank them uh, specifically. Thank you. Uh, the World Manufacturing Foundation and my colleagues uh, at the IT Manufacturing working on the scene and behind the scenes to make this uh, possible. So also applause for them, please. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, uh, uh, the audience, all of you, both in presence and online, for, for staying with us. Thank you very much and stay tuned. Bye bye.